Today's episode of Roadie Free Radio is brought to you in part by Boulevard Carol Entertainment Group. They handle everything from productions to rehearsals and installations with an expert staff and state-of-the-art equipment. No matter the size of your production, from rehearsal to curtain, they've got you covered. So head over to BoulevardCarol.com today and learn more. What's happening, roadies? This is Mark Yourselli. This is Ashley Shepard. What's happening, roadies? This is Eric Samuelson from Three Crown Studio, and you're listening to Roadie Free Radio. What's up, roadies? My name is Larry Milburn, and this is Roadie Free Radio, your VIP pass to meet and greet the stars behind the scenes of the music and film business. All righty, all righty, okie dokie, okie dokie. What's happening, folks? Welcome to episode 164 of Roadie Free Radio. I am your host, Larry Milburn, and I am coming at you from a barn in Northwest Connecticut. What is going on? Today's guest is Eric Samuelson, owner of Three Crown Studio in Brooklyn, New York. Before we jump in today, guys, I got a couple of happy birthday shout outs for you. Dan Winstrom, Greg Martin, Tanya O'Callaghan, and Jason Greenberg. Happy birthday to you in this crazy time. Folks, how we doing? How y'all holding up out there? It's, uh, It's a kooky time. It is the week of March 30th, We are about 14 to 20 days in on the coronavirus lockdown, self-stay-at-home situation, and um, I'm wondering how you're all holding up. I didn't come at you last week because I put out a bunch of other old episodes while I got some things together and had the week to figure out how things were going to shake down. I'm sure like many of you, uh, you know, we're, we're all freaked out about what's going on. We're freaked out about money freaked out about work. We got our kids home. My four and a half year old, he's done. That's it. School's done for the year. He's here. We got to figure out the homeschooling situation is again, many of you have to do it. How are you coping? What are you doing? There are some tremendous uh, Facebook live videos happening. I see a lot of talented people, musicians and whatnot, uh, you know, hosting happy hours at 530, six o'clock in the evening playing music, doing all these great things, you know, Zoom chats and and, uh, webinars and all this kind of stuff are going on. It's really kind of cool to see. And I hope that you are taking advantage of it and not sitting around with your heads in your hands, you know, despairing about things right now. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Yeah, there's a lot of unknowns, but, um, you know, as they keep saying, and my 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 wife wants to tear people's heads off when she hears it, but we are all in this together, and we are all going to get through it together. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on out there, and there's a lot of cool stuff, resources. If you're looking to uh, file for unemployment, if you've got to shut your business down, there are a lot of cool and great resources to tackle It just is a matter of weeding through a lot of the crap to get to them, but you can find it. uh, The touring community has also really come together to provide a lot of cool stuff. Again, if you head over to this Tour Life or the Tour Health Research Initiative um, at tourhealth.org, you can find a lot of cool stuff over there. Uh, Ryan's been involved with a lot of great panels, so so be sure to head over and check it out. And this is a great time to take the survey uh, while you can, while you're home, torhealth.org to do that. So we're getting through, I'm getting through. It's a good time to book up some interviews and I've been doing that and getting some great guests on the show. So stay tuned. If there's anything I can do for you in the meantime, let me know. Info at roadiefreeradio.com. If there's uh, someone you want to reach out to or make a connection or you want some advice on something, let me know. I am also thinking about starting up some podcast consulting if you are interested. So you can hit me up for that directly at info at roadiefreeradio.com. We can spend an hour on a Skype call or something if you've got an idea. Um, for starting a show. You don't know where to start, how to start, what to do, the resources and whatnot. I'm happy to provide that and we can talk rates and all that good stuff. So info at I'm happy to help out 
uh, where I can. Now, another way I can help you out is to give you three killer shows right now on Netflix that, uh, that we've been watching and we've gotten through. The first one is the ZZ Top documentary that's out right now. Really very cool. I did not know that much about ZZ Top. My introduction to them was really, um, you know, the Eliminator album when I was a kid and, uh, you know, the red car and all that stuff, seeing them on, um, on MTV, but this digs a lot deeper into their history and it's really well shot and well done and super cool. So check out the ZZ top documentary on Netflix. Um, also tiger King about Joe exotic is, Oh God, it's a guilty pleasure and it's just delicious. You got to go watch this show. It is really, really fascinating and cool. Tiger King, whoo, Joe exotic. And finally, Ozark. My wife and I have been fans of Ozark for the last three seasons. It came out Friday. You can binge watch it. We already have finished it. We're done. We've gotten through all 10 episodes. It's an incredible show. Jason Bateman, Laura Linney, the whole cast is amazing. It's shot well. It The music is great. Really cool show. So check out Ozark. Also want to let you guys know that guitar tech Claire Murphy, who was on the show a couple weeks back, her book is out, as I've said, Girl on the Road, How to Break into Touring from a Female Perspective. Uh, you can buy this thing on Amazon. She was kind enough to send me a copy. I'm going to start reading it right away. It's it's only, how, how big, how long is this thing? 65 pages, man. Nothing. 65 pages. A lot of good resources. A lot of good stuff. There is a link in the show notes for this on the website. You can head over, click on it. Boom. Takes you to Amazon. You can download the book. It's a few bucks. Help help a girl out. You know what I'm saying? Also want to let you guys know about something cool. Focus Right is doing a Focus Right podcast studio makeover. I saw this. I'm going to apply. What the hell? I could use a makeover. We could all use a little makeover, but this is a great thing. If you are, you know, if you're just starting out and you're looking to take your show to the next level, if you're thinking about starting, they are awarding three podcasters with a complete studio makeover valued at over $2,300 each and the chance for you and your podcast to be featured in a video project produced by Focusrite. Uh, They're giving out everything from Scarlett 818s, in your interfaces to heel sound pro dynamic microphones, studio headphones, backpacks, uh, coaching from, uh, let's see who they got. They got coaching one hour free coaching from Harry Dern, the host of the podcast junkies founder of full cast. Um, they're doing design sessions, all kinds of stuff. So check it out, man. I put a link to this in the description as well. So you can go ahead and sign up for the Focusrite Podcast Studio Makeover. No, we are not sponsored by Focusrite, but I do use the Scarlett 2i2 interface right here in the studio. In fact, you're hearing it right now. It is the second thing in the chain after my Roswell Pro Audio Mini K87 microphone that I really like. Have you guys checked out Roadie My Documentary by TJ Hoffman? You should do so. RoadieMyDocumentary.com is the place to go find TJ's film about life on the road. Wow. Had he waited, you know, a couple more years, he could have added this whole coronavirus situation to it. And uh, that certainly would have been interesting. Uh, guys, we were also sponsored today by Show Pro Beard Co. Started by live audio engineer Chris Wilson, the audio wizard. He and his wife have created their very own unique formula of beard balm that not only performs well in terms of health and nourishment, it also provides the control, shine, and pleasant aroma that any bearded professional would appreciate. These are non-waxy, all-natural beard bombs that will leave your beard soft, smooth, and nourished. Choose from a variety of natural smelling scents like Home Sweet Home, Morning Wood, Through the Woods, Chain Motor Oil, and of course, Original Unscented. Use the code Roadie to get 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off, man, when you use the code Roadie over at showprobeardco.com. Last couple of things, guys, I wanted to let you know, do not forget, because right now it is on sale. They're having a special, The Last Seat in the House, The Story of Hanley Sound by John Kane is available. There is a link in the show notes. Check that out. Fantastic book about Bill Hanley, audio pioneer, audio innovator, sound guy for Woodstock, sound guy for the Beatles. 
you got to check it out. The Last Seat in the House, a story of Hanley Sound by John Kane. Go check it out. Again, as usual, thank you guys for all of your reviews on iTunes and SoundCloud. It means a lot. I really appreciate it. So thank you for doing that. If you haven't done so and you got uh, 30 spare seconds in your day, head over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, as they call it. Drop me a review, a comment, whatever you'd like. Hey, we're also sponsored today by AirTurn.com. Since 2008, AirTurn has been manufacturing wireless products such as Bluetooth pedals and multifunction remotes, supporting hundreds and thousands of customers in over 40 countries. They have a wide range of products to choose from, including the AirTurn Go Stand, one of the best portable mic stands on the market. It's the one that I use on this show on a regular basis. Head over to AirTurn.com. Use the code RODY to save 10% off your entire order. That's RODY to save 10% off your entire order over at AirTurn.com. Uh, okay, here we go. Today's guest, Eric Samuelson, an Ohio boy, record producer, recording engineer, owns his own studio, Three Crown Studio, right there in Brooklyn, New York. Comes from a musical background in his family. Received a B.A. in Media Arts and Sciences from Ohio University. Moved to New York with his wife. Started working at Guitar Center just to make some extra cash on the side. Very quickly rose up through the ranks. Managed the Guitar Center in Brooklyn before really diving in full time with Three Crown Studio, and he has just been crushing it ever since he left Guitar Center, and he's been focusing just on Three Crown Studio. So I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. Hit me up if you have any questions. Info at roadyfreeradio.com. You guys be safe. Be cool. Hang in there. We're going to get through this thing. Here we go with Mr. Eric Samuelson. Hit it, hit it. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Eric, dude, my first COVID-19 interview. How the hell are you? <laughs> I'm chilling in, uh, chilling in my home one-bedroom apartment bunker with a, with a, a somewhat rigged-up audio setup here. <laughs> how's, how's everything going, man? Are you uh, all right? Yeah, it's going fine, you know. Uh, wife's yeah. working from home. We're just kind of hanging here, making do, hanging with the dog, cooking food. <laughs> we're doing whatever work we can do, you know. The usual. Yeah. yeah no kids yeah. yet, though, huh? No, no kids. Just the four-legged yeah. furry friend. <laughs> I, uh, we've, we've got a four-and-a-half-year-old, and it's been a bit tricky. We're, we're fully into homeschooling at this point. Yeah, I feel for that, like man. Like the I, rest. So many friends and, and siblings with kids, and I'm like, Phew. Man, my life ain't so hard. <laughs> it's uh, it's just a tricky balance. It's a tricky balance, you know. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. My wife, I realized this morning as we were like sitting down, I was like, "Huh, okay, I'm down to like a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> my bank account's basically almost overdrawn, yeah. and my wife just started, uh, you know, applying for unemployment because her business had to shut down." So I'm like, oh. all right, we're we're in the shit now. This is yep. it. Better yep. get out there and start doing some podcasting. Get we're my mind it. off it. <laughs> we are in it, dude. I I uh, noticed on your website that um, you've got a testimony from Chris Graham, and I want to know how you know that guy because Chris and I know each other as well. He was on yeah. a podcast panel. I was going to say I had a feeling you being in the in the both the podcasting and the the sort of audio and uh, entertainment industry, you might know him. But yeah, Chris. Um, yeah. Uh, so I actually, you know, Chris and I grew up not too far from each other in Ohio. I never knew him while I was in Ohio, but, um, I met him cause I actually started listening to his podcast. Um, yeah. and then, uh, at some point in time, him and I just got to talking. Um, and then we found out that we both went to Ohio university. We missed each other by just like a year or so. Um, you know, we, we both had been in a lot of the same places, just literally a few years apart from each other. Um, and, so and it cool. was funny. And then, you know, our relationship kind of grew from there and, and I ended up, uh, uh, he ended up doing some business coaching with me as well. Uh, so we cool. worked together on a professional level and, um, and, and, you know, now we're just sort of friends and we talk a lot via the internet and Marco Polo and, you know, yeah. we, we cry together and we laugh together through the, the, the <laughs> tough and the fun. Um, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're in the tough now, man, trying to yep. make it fun. It's been, it's been, nuts. I got to reach out to some of those guys, Chris and Liz Shaw and, and those guys yeah. and see how, yeah. they're all, yeah. how they're doing, man. It's been, uh, it, it's been about, I don't know what it's been like for you. For me, it's been a balance of like trying to still be creative 
and get the get the work out and do that while still trying to get a couple of client things done and the family thing. But then because you're home alone or not home alone, but I guess, you know, because we're all quarantined or whatever, you get in that weird sort of rut of like, ah, not reaching out to people. Netflix is just a little bit easier yep, to yep. deal with. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, I, I mean, here in New York, like the, the first thing that shut down, obviously, was bars and restaurants. And uh, yeah. I'd say 98% of my clientele and customers and people I work with are, you know, professional full-time gigging musicians. Uh, right. So they were immediately the first ones out of a job because there's no gigs, there's no tours, there's no, you know... Uh, you know, yeah. and then it, it's not really appropriate to go busking in the subways, which is always the last minute ditch here in the city is like, shoot, I need a yeah. couple hundred bucks. Let me go busk real quick. But everyone's like, nope, stay out of the public. Don't go anywhere crowded. Don't go into. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, it was that. And then so it was pretty quick for me as far as just being like, okay, I need to, I need to sort of hunker down here and, and do what I can and start getting mobile and start just reaching out to people, talking to people. Um, yeah. and the silver lining has been that, you know, so many of these musicians now have this unexpected time on their hands to just be able to stay at home and, and work on their craft. And, um, yeah. so, you know, I've had a little bit of work here and there, things that I can do remotely projects that I can do for people, which has been great. But a lot of my time has honestly been spent just talking, talking to people on the phone and, and kind of coaching them a little bit and encouraging them and, and getting them to take advantage of, of the situation so that when we do come out of this, hopefully I'll have uh, a lot of, a lot of people with a lot of fresh new material that they're excited to put out into the world, you know, <laughs> with no money to go into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, and I'm in the same boat, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not picking on you with that. It's, you know, no, no, I'm no, a video, it is I'm a it video is. guy. I'm a video guy. Right. So I'm like, Oh man, I'll get all my whole business plan together and do all that stuff. And then when this is yeah. all done, snap back to work but no companies are going to have any money <laughs> to spend on video production. You know, it's going to be bartering up the wazoo. It's going to be yep. crazy, man. Yep. Um, you opened three crown like a year ago. Is that right? In 2019? No, I opened up the, the actual so brick and mortar, I, the actual brick and mortar. Yeah. A little over a year ago. Yep. Okay. How far is that from your place? Uh, it's nice and quick. It's maybe two subway stops, 15 minute drive. Yeah. When's, when's the last time you were down there? Uh, I was there. Going? I was there last week. Um, I I could. The building's not shut down. Luckily, there's uh, in that building. It's a you know big, multi commercial space building. Um, yeah. And some of the some of the places in there are considered essential. So therefore, the biz, the building itself is open, which is great. So I can access it anytime I want. But, um, you know, the reality is like I don't I don't have a necessary reason to go there right now. Um, yeah. A lot of the work that I've been able to do, I can do from home with a laptop and a set of headphones. Um, yep. so I'm just trying to be responsible and smart and, and just stay put, you know? Yeah. But is it, um, is it a little nerve wracking to have the overhead of a studio? And I mean, you just opened basically a year ago. So you're kind of fresh in that, like I'm doing it phase. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like, oh shit, someone's pulled the rug out from under you. Well, I, I mean, I kind of feel like that's the case for me every month. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing new <laughs> really <laughs> no not necessarily like. <laughs> not necessarily but you know it's it, it yeah it's scary but again I, you know yeah. i find comfort in the fact that everybody's in the same toilet together right now you know yeah it's, yeah, it's totally. not just me it's not like i'm failing and everyone around me is is like hey man i'm doing great everything's wonderful yeah. you know it's sort of like yeah you know what it sucks right now but it sucks for everybody so um yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you think of the um the sort of deluge of of online performing that's going on? You know, a lot of people are doing yeah. s Facebook Live and recorded stuff. I think stuff it's kind of cool. Putting, put a lot of tunes out there. Yeah. I think it's cool. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of what I've been doing and it, it's been fascinating for me to watch a lot of this, but a lot of what I've been doing with with people um that I work with outside of just recording them is is trying to trying to come up with more creative ideas for them to exist in the modern music industry world as an independent artist. And, and a lot of that has to do with a focus on content creation um, yeah. and making sure that they're not just playing in the local bars, but that they're putting, you know, regular content out there, even if it's just photographs or, or video messages or anything to be able to build, 
you know, a following online. And that can be a difficult thing, I think, for for artists that are sort of in the in the grind musically to take yeah. the time and set the time aside to do that because they feel like, oh, well, that's just sort of selling out or, you know, things. I don't know, whatever the mental thing is, you know, they might be just subconsciously thinking these things. Um, sure. It's like, well, I could practice my instrument right now or try to get a gig or I could sit down and post a picture online. You know, what am I going to do? Um, yeah. But it's been kind of fun to see the creative ways in which people have now realized that they have to use the internet. They have to use uh, stuff and they have to be able to create virtual content and put it out there. You know, I've seen yep. live performances that are actual, like, you know, just live streamed performances and shows. I've seen people that I yep. work with get creative where they actually put on like a virtual concert in their apartment where they, they had somebody actually like walk down the hallway with the camera and the light and bust into his room as if it was the green room and, and like <laughs> do a backstage interview with them. And then he came out into the living room and they had like cheering noises of a huge crowd in the background. Awesome. And it made it seem like he was just doing this huge stadium concert, but it was just literally in his apartment and it was very creative and fun. And yeah. uh, so it's been enjoyable and uh, you know, right before all this stuff blew up here in the city uh, and and things really hunkered down, um, uh, my wife, who works with wedding dresses for a living, so she has a lot of communication with people in Asia, and um, and she was showing me over the weekend a few weeks ago uh, this, this song that the Vietnamese government had kind of backed and put out there. Uh, this Jen Covey, and it's and it's a cover of another Vietnamese song, but they rewrote it, and it's the like the washing your hands song. Uh, yeah. it's all about. And it was on Johnny Oliver, and she's showing me. She's like, this thing's blowing up. Look at this, and I I thought it was so cool that a that a a, a country took music and used it as a way to sort of raise awareness for a pandemic and <laughs> just teach basic right. hygiene. Um, yeah. and then there's all these, these TikTok videos of kids doing dance moves to it and all this. And a lot of the people I work with here in the city, uh, I guess just cause I'm into it and I, I spent a lot of years down in Southern Ohio, but uh, a lot of them are folk musicians. So I work with a lot of like folk, a lot of bluegrass, uh, a lot of acoustic performance. Um, and so I hit up a, a, a long time band that I've worked with for many years and done several projects with, and I, and they're just, they're good friends, they're family at this point. Uh, and I started texting them. I said, have you guys seen this? Like, we need to do like a folk bluegrass version of this. I, I can't find an English version anywhere of this song yet. I don't think people here know about it. Um, yeah. and so that was Saturday night and Monday night, we all got in there, uh, went to the studio at like 10 o'clock at night. We translated the song, created a folk bluegrass Americana version of it, recorded it, shot video, cut it and released it Wednesday morning. Um, and it, I, I didn't really know what to expect. It was just kind of one of those things where like, Hey, I think shit's going to hit the fan here pretty soon. Like, can we just do one yeah. last fun thing before we're all... <laughs> stuck somewhere <laughs> officially and and we did and and it's now over half a million views it kind of blew up uh which is pretty amazing um that's awesome man so and what's the know, band the good morning nags the good morning nags yep yeah yeah you've worked with them quite a bit yeah yep yeah I, yep. uh i met the guitar player of that band shortly after i moved here to the city he was kind of one of the first uh people that i i started hanging out with outside of work on a musical level and uh -huh. Um, uh, I was, I was working for guitar center at the time, you know, when we first moved to the city here, um, I just, you know, you got to pay the bills. And, and I was like, you know, I, if I'm going to just get a job and work in retail or whatever, it might as well be musical. So I started working at the the guitar center and it actually ended up becoming an incredible experience for me. I have no complaints. Um, yeah. I got to do so much. I got to work at five different stores here in the city. I got to move up really quickly. I got to meet a massive network of incredible musicians, both customers and people that worked for me and with me. Sure. Um, sure. You know, it, it was, it was actually exactly what I needed. And it, and it also kind of yep. taught me how to, how to run a business, you know, because sure. Um, you were managing, right? Yeah. I was, I was, you know, I started off just in sales, but like I said, I, I rose up pretty quick. Um, and then my last couple of years there I was managing. So I, I ran the queen store. I managed at the Manhattan store for a while. And then, my last year and a half there, I was a store manager of the Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn store. So, you know, I was, I was running stores with 50 plus employees and doing, you know, nine, $10 million in sales a year and, and having yeah. to keep track of all that stuff and budget all that stuff. And, and so when I, when I left that and started my, my just me business, I was like, why does it, you know, it seems like nothing now. It seems so simple. It's like my PL right. sheet is like six lines instead of 400 <laughs> different things, you know? So you went to Ohio university for music production. Yeah. Um, did you learn a lot of those things there as well? Was there a foundation in sort of the business side as well, or was it purely 
the creative and the technical? Um, no, I didn't, I didn't feel like I learned a whole lot about the specific business stuff. Um, I mean, obviously yeah. there's, there's, you know, with a bachelor, there's basic economic courses, you know, you take like your, your yeah. micro and macroeconomics and, and things like yeah. that. Um, but no, there, there wasn't a huge focus on, um, on like running a studio business or anything like that. You know, the, the program when I started there was, was fairly new. Um, and I think at that time it was fairly new for colleges to be offering a bachelor's in audio production and recording, um, yeah. which is kind of what intrigued me when I found out that they were doing it and they were building a studio and that you could do that, uh, at school there. Um, cause that's not, the, that's, that's not a Ohio university is not just a music school, right? I mean, it's like a, no, no, no. Like it's regular, like, it's a big old, regular full university. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not like going to Full Sail or MIT or one of those gigs. Correct. It's like right. So that is that's pretty cool that they that they offered that. Yeah, so they they had a school. They call it the School of Media Arts and Sciences, and you know it was it was just sort of like a a catch all of of you know um, audio, video, you know, learning video production, learning how to do audio stuff and everything like that. And then um, I think they just happened to be one of the earlier larger universities to recognize that music recording and music specifically not just for video and tv but it could actually be kind of an industry and a career so um you know they got some pretty awesome professors on board that were really good audio engineers and they built a really nice studio you know we had a a a neve uh 32 channel neve console in there and we also had a a second room with a a digi design you know digital suite and um, and a shared live room. And it was, you know, it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous facility. It was actually kind of spoiled to be able to go to school and work in that facility. Cause I, I still dream yeah. about it, you know, <laughs> I bet, I bet. And it's brand new. Nothing's fucked up yet. Yeah. Right? I mean, it still smelled a little like sawdust, you know, it was, yeah, it was great. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool, man. And you had a, a teacher mentor there, Eddie Ashworth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I got to work under, uh, under him mostly, which was, which was an amazing experience. He was awesome. Um, you know, I, I never really got the opportunity. I was just on the, on the other end of the curve as far as being able to work on a lot of tape and reel to reel and things like that. Um, like my very first studio experience, uh, when I first got to go into a professional studio and record, um, you know, they were working on ADATs at that time. So by the time I was a little bit older and actually in college and, and learning how to record at that time, it was full blown pro tools, logic, uh, and everything. But he really came from a, an old school background of recording. So even though he's very hip to the newer technologies, you know, he was the one that influenced them to get a new console, for example, which was pretty awesome. Um, yep. and you know, he, he really taught us to be able to use pro tools as a, as a, as a tool for what it is and to be able to record with it and everything. But he always stressed, you know, the importance of making sure that what you're capturing sounds good you, before you capture it, how you capture it. And so by the time it hits Pro Tools, it should already sound good. So he had that really awesome old school mentor, uh, mentorship that, that was neat. You know, he, he was really hands on with, with showing us how to, uh, use our ears first, you know, right. And, and right. was very adamant not, about not your eyes, not yeah, your exactly, eyes, not watching exactly. the waveforms. Yeah. And was very yeah, adamant yeah. about not ever saying, you know, don't worry, we'll fix it later. You know, that was like a huge pet peeve of his, which has now become a huge pet peeve of mine. Uh, it's a, yeah. it's always a red flag in a session when someone's talking to monks bandmates and they're like, well, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. Well, he can just fix it later. And I'm like, whoa, 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 stop. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. Well, it's funny because I was going to ask you because you, you call him out in your bio yeah, and, and on the web page and everything. So I was curious to know what what was it you gleaned from him? It sounds like that's certainly a big one. Yeah. I mean, you know, the first thing I remember is the first time I got to step into his office and uh, and he had, uh, you know, the, the framed, um, I think it was platinum, but, you know, the, the framed album that, that you see you know, quote unquote, successful people have on their walls. And, and he had one sitting on the wall of his office and it was the self-titled sublime album. Uh, and then written inside there on there was, was a note from them saying like, thanks so much, Eddie, much love, you know, uh, like with a Sharpie. And I, you know, growing up, that was just an album that I, I absolutely loved that album. I listened to it all the time in the car, driving around. I knew all the words to it. And so to walk into his yeah. office and be like, wait, how do you know? How? And he was like, oh, I mixed that. And I'm like, what? You got to work? On? Like, <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, so a little yeah. bit starstruck the first time I met him, um, but uh, ended up just being a great guy. And, and I got to work really closely with him. And he was always, always really awesome about teaching us everything, you know, and, and, and in the right ways. And um 
And I feel lucky to have done that, you know, I feel lucky to have worked with him. I think that you don't have to go to a university to learn how to be an audio engineer. And that's always a big debate. And it's always a, you know, yeah. you know a lot of people that are like, screw education, just do it, man. That's how you learn and, and all yeah. stuff. And to some degree, they're right. You don't have to do it. I mean, in my case, I really wanted a bachelor's degree. That's just okay. all there was to it. You know, I, I, my parents were, were awesome and they were willing to pay for me to go to school and, I just felt like, you know what, if I don't do it now while I'm younger, you know, then later on in life, I don't want to, A, I might not be able to go back, you know, at that point in time, I'll probably have to pay for it myself. So I just kind of really wanted a bachelor's degree, but I was also not necessarily the most studious person. So I knew that if I was going to go to school, I'd have to be going for something that I was passionate about. Otherwise, I'd have no motivation to like, just getting an A is not a motivation for me, you know? (laughs) Yeah, right, Um, right, right. Yeah, you got to be, you got to have your heart into it. Yeah, exactly. And actually, I, right out of high school, I first tried to go to college for music performance um, on saxophone. I tried to do jazz performance in theory. And it was actually that I did that for one year. And it was that year that that made me sort of self realize um, that being a professional performing musician was not the path for me. Um, because looking, I, I, I just. I didn't enjoy sitting in a practice room and, in, in, you know, ironic now, but in solitary confinement um, <laughs> for eight hours a day running scales and, and doing all the things that you have to do to be a, a professional musician. Um, yep. I didn't enjoy that. I, I really just want to play in that's bands. Just the, that's just getting to work on your instrument. That's not like all the other shit that a right. professional musician has to deal with, right? Right, that's right, like right. Getting the gig, getting burned on something, yep. band, mate, band dynamics and all that shit happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, it, it just became clear to me that like, mm, I, you know, it, it wasn't right. And, and I had yeah. kind of a bit of a crashing down moment in life. Cause you know, going through grade school and high school and, um, not to boast, but I was always one of the better musicians in all of the, the ensembles that I was in. And I, it always kind of came very easy to me. Uh, and, uh, I could play multiple different genres and multiple different instruments and, and be able to fit in, um, and always thought that like, yeah, well, this makes, this makes sense. No brainer. I should be a professional musician and then going to college and then having this realization of like, oh, I don't want to be a professional musician. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, and it was sort of like, <laughs> now what do I do with my life? Um, so I took yeah. a year off from school from that and that's when I started gigging out and that's when I started um, getting into recording. Um, I was playing a lot of jazz gigs, a lot of like combo gigs and things, and it was heavily improvised. Um, Mm -hmm. so the reason why I started recording my gigs was so that I could listen to them later and hear what the heck we actually did and and start to pick it apart. And, and, you know, I'd listen to the trumpet player solos and start to transcribe and be like, oh man, what he did there was so cool, you know, and things. And then before I knew it, uh, you know, my, my one little mic set up in the corner turned into like, I was miking each person and multi-track recording it. And, and then I started mixing, mixing our, our little gigs and, and while uh, you were playing. (laughs) <laughs> Not while we were playing. No, I would go back later afterwards and, yeah. and and mix them like live albums, and then and then we would put them out like at our gigs. We'd start putting the suitcase out in front with like, hey, check out our live recording from you know whatever, and um, it was like selling them for five bucks, just trying to make a little extra money. And while some um, of that was happening, and you were getting to learn those chops, were you were you at all interested in in live sound and getting into that or no? Not really. And if and if not, how come? I don't. I don't know. I never really had an interest for that. I, I I can't really give you a reason why. I'm not sure. Um, I think I just fell into recording first, to be honest with yep. you. Um, yep. I think it was the excitement of of being able to go back after the fact and and work with it and polish it and and um, and make it into into something else. You know. Um, yeah. I, I think I just, I had fun with that process. I had fun going home after playing the gig and after playing the show and having something else to do, if that makes right. sense. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. And I think by the time I had the opportunity to try to do live sound, you know, obviously I had a lot of friends and bands and I was in a band and then I started getting more into recording and people were like, oh, you're an audio person. Can you run sound for our show? And I'd be like, yeah, no problem. I know how to use a mixing board. I've done this plenty of times. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, I have no idea what, like everything's feeding back. <laughs> Nothing sounds good. What's <laughs> happening here? And, uh, you know, I, I, after doing that a couple of times, I, I eventually just started telling people like, no, nah, I, I, you don't want me to do that. Uh, you yeah. Know, <laughs> trust me, just find somebody else. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any reason for me not going towards doing live sound. I think I just, I, I ended up finding a different path earlier and I yep. fell in love That's with it. That's cool. You know? 
the video on your website about sort of who you are and Three Crown. Yeah. Um, is awesome. The whole Thank analog you. tape thing. Thank you. Um, begs the question, though, are you mostly an analog studio? Are you a hybrid? What are you? Absolutely a hybrid. Okay. Definitely. Um, I, I record everything in Pro Tools. Um, and But but I, and I, this probably all comes back to, to what I talked about with, with, you know, what I learned in school and, and studying under Eddie. Um, you know, I appreciate what analog brings to the table. I appreciate what it does to sound. And I appreciate being able to have something sound good before we ever start mixing it or opening up plugins. Um, yep. So I try to, in the recording process, treat Pro Tools as my tape machine, essentially. Um, gotcha. So, um, you know, all my, all my preamps are outboard. Um, you know, I have, I have a selection of different ones. I've got some, some Neve preamps, some API preamps and things like that. I have outboard compressors. Um, and I do have that little quarter inch reel to reel, uh, which is a lot of fun because it only goes up to seven and a half IPS, the speed. It's a pretty slow, like consumer speed. It's not like a hi-fi mastering yeah. machine. Um, right. But it's hooked up so that we can, after the fact, have tracks recorded in Pro Tools. We can bounce them out to that and bounce them right back into the session, um, which can be a lot of fun when you're working on stuff where you don't want that really nice, pristine, yeah, uh, like that beautiful, you know, pro studio sound. It's like, oh, let's do this, or, yeah. or because it's a slower tape speed, sometimes running just like the kick drums and the toms through it, it just adds this huge woof to the low end because the EQ curve and um, so we can use you a lot finish of to it. Do you What's offer that? that as a thing to like, can you finish to that? Does someone want to finish yeah. two track to that thing? Can you, you can finish to that for them? Yep. Yeah. A lot of times or when I master right to that, a lot of times when That's I master awesome. a project for people, um, you know, usually I'll send them two versions. I'll say like, Hey, here's, here's two versions. Uh, uh -huh. I won't tell them which is which. And I'll say, just let me know which one you like. And one of them will be my, my digitally mastered version. And one of them will be that master and then passed through that tape machine. Um, and it's funny, you know, sometimes hit me, people hit me back and they're like, absolutely this one. And it's definitely the digital one. And sometimes people are like, absolutely this one. And it's the tape one, you know, so it's kind of a fun thing I like yeah. to do. And, um, that's and very it's, cool. It's always good. I always try to look for ways to, to under promise and over deliver. You know, you tell somebody you're going to master something and then you send them two versions and they're like, oh, wow. You know? Yeah. Right. Um, so <laughs> what is your, um, what's your mic of choice? Or what's Ooh. your what's your mic selection right now? And right now you're on an SM7B. Yep. Um, old faithful. What's your what's your mic of choice? The old faithful. Uh, <laughs> what's your uh, what's your mic of choice in the studio? Or what's the selection? I guess. And then what's your go to? Sure. Um, I mean, go to would have to depend on what I'm recording, <laughs> of course. But uh, yeah. I have I have a a couple of you know the classics that everybody has. Obviously I'm using an SM7B right now. Um, I've got SM57s, I've got all that stuff, you know, basically what yeah. you'll find in, in everybody's recording setup or mic locker. Um, then uh, I, I've got a pair of Royer ribbons, the R121s, which I absolutely am in love with. I mean, I just, I think they've got a phenomenal sound to them. They're very natural. I, I record a lot of acoustic instruments. Um, mm -hmm. So they're great for that. They're great for drum overheads. Um, and I guess outside of the, the norm, I have several microphones by Charter Oak Acoustics, yep. um, which they're actually up in Connecticut based out of there in Enfield. Um, oh, cool. but, uh, I got to try a pair of those, uh, microphones when I was working out of somebody else's studio here in the city and I'd never heard of the company before. And I was like, Whoa, like these sound incredible. It was like an immediate, like, wow, you know, kind of moment. Yeah. So. I yeah. talked to the guy who owns the studio. I said, hey, where, where'd, you, where'd you get these? And, and he was like, oh, Mike Deming, he designs these. He's a friend of mine. Here's his cell phone number. And I was kind of like, oh, all right, sweet. So I called the guy up. We talked for like two hours. And then the next day, he ended up driving down to the city and giving me a pair of handmade mics that he had built for me. And since then, we've just been really close friends. Um, That's awesome. I've got a ton of his stuff. And now it's being, uh, it's being produced and manufactured um, out in California. Um, still phenomenal quality, but it's kind of fun. I have a, a sort of collection of his mics from back when he was hand building them in Enfield, Connecticut, all the way up to the new stuff now that's, that's like precision machined and, and, right. and, and all that. So, um, but yeah, a lot of vacuum tube mics from him. Um, definitely Very my go-to cool. for vocals. They just, he was a long time engineer himself before he started building gear. So his whole thing is, is I build gear that, that sounds musically pleasing. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Like he hates the whole idea of like making a transparent microphone. He's like, music isn't transparent. Right. You know, everybody wants color and juice and a little grit on things. And so yeah, you record yeah. it transparent and then we spend days and days pushing it through different boxes to try to get it to sound the way we actually want it to sound. So it's fun. The stuff you definitely have to choose it for a purpose because his stuff does have a sound to it, you know. So that's um, interesting. Again, you're drawn to that idea of getting it in the recording first. Yeah, I am not afraid. Right, of getting getting it at the source. So yeah, I, I don't have choosing, commitment issues. Yeah, right. So you're choosing a particular mic to color something right off the bat. Yes, all the way down the chain, basically, so that Absolutely. later you're not fixing or tweaking or fucking with it in post. Right. I mean, I, you, you might know, obviously do a bit of that. There's a bit of that that happens, but of course, of course. But my goal is you know. by the time I get to finishing a recording and moving on to you know a lot of the projects I work on, I'm I'm on it from start to finish. Um, right. I, I do just mix and just master for some people on some projects, but a lot of them, I'm the one from, from talking about the project in the beginning to doing pre-production, to arranging the songs, to recording it, to mastering it, to helping them market it and promote it. And put, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm a partner. Yeah. I'm there all the way through. Um, yeah. so if, if I am in it for that long game and I get to the point where I have to mix this project and I have to do a whole bunch of stuff and try at that point to figure out what the song is going to sound like, I'm screwed. You know, right. like I don't have the right. perspective anymore at that point to know. So um, things might change in the creative process, but we usually try to nail down the arrangements, the performance, what we want the song to sound like, how we want to approach the the production of it before we ever touch the record button. Um, yeah. So by the time we're recording, I've got a pretty good clear idea of where I want things to sit in this song and how I want things to to be. Do I want them to be forward? Do I want them double tracked and stereo spread? You know, and so yeah, yeah. I, I will choose microphones and choose how I record things accordingly, um, so that when we get to you know post and editing and mixing, it already sounds really good. And now it's yeah. just kind of like cool. Let's get that last ten percent and 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 you know really and polish it up and get it there. It's funny because. I don't know if this applied to audio when I, when this started going on, but there was sort of a phrase that was buzzing around. I mean, at least 10 years ago that pre-production is the new post-production. And I don't know if that made its way in, in my world, in film world, it was definitely a big thing. Yeah. Um, and that idea was a big thing and it's exactly what you're describing, right? Cause like if you're, tone if your dialogue if you're whatever the mood the setting isn't on the page let's say if we're talking about making a film yeah then that problem is always there from script through shooting through the edit like you're not going to fix that type of thing right. in post right? right no no music cue or whatever is going to tweak that so it's like if you have to do 50 revisions of your script to get it right then that's what you should really focus on and then of yeah. course your shot list and build it out from there. And it's the same exact thing you're talking about, right? I mean, it's like, you're not going to sure. fix if a lyrics, obviously a lyric you can redo, but like, you know, if the vibe of the song, let's say, isn't there inherently from the writing of it to the production of it, you, yeah, you, the, know, you can turn all the knobs you want, but it ain't going to get there. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's a plugin out there that's called vibe, but, um, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to do what, yeah. what you're talking about. I mean, it, you know, just like right. in a film, you know, you, when you watch a really good movie or a really good show or, or something like that, you're not sitting there thinking about, you know, all the decisions that were made as far as the lighting and, you know, the, the lens and, you know, the, the shutter speed and all of these, you know, like you're not thinking about yeah. these things. It's just a really good show and it's a really good movie and you yeah. enjoy it. And so you yeah. recommend it to people or you watch it 10 times. You know, it's the same thing with music. If you listen to a really great production or a really great song, um, you kind of forget about all of those things. Um, and I yeah. think a lot of people don't think about those things at all. Uh, but for me, yeah. I'm somebody who does those things for a living. I love when I put on a record or I put on a, a, a song or something and I completely forget about the whole production experience and I just listen to the music. And that's, I think that comes from having a vision and having a goal in mind before you start um, yeah. and being able to sort of chase that vision and, and achieve that goal. As opposed of the, to, yeah, yeah. Well, I was gonna say of the uh, of all the stages, the writing, the you know the pre planning part, the recording and mixing and mastering and all that kind of stuff. Where's the one? Is there one where you're like, okay, I'm back in my sweet spot here. This is I like this one the most, and oh shit, I got a master. Not so confident there. 
or uh, helping a helping an artist write something or create something is just it's like fucking tearing my hair out. Or are you just in love with the whole process? I'm I'm definitely in love with the whole process, but obviously there are a lot of steps in the process and there are some parts that are more fun than others. I mean, for me, my, like my real jam is, is still my original discovery of this passion in the first place. And that's, that's when we've got everybody in there and we're tracking like, that's yeah. just fun for me because it combines playing instruments, performing music, which I've always been gravitated towards. Um, yeah. and, and, and having people together in the same room and, and having people laughing and smiling and listening back and there's discovery going on and, uh, it's just a real fun, exciting part of the process because when you get the recording right and everyone listens back for the first time, they're like, oh, we just created a masterpiece. You know, everybody always sort of like feels that yeah. like, oh, we did it. You know, we've the song is there. We got it, you know. Yep. Um, so that's always yep. a lot of fun. Um, you know, the, the post process, the, the editing and the mixing, that can obviously be a little bit of a challenge and a grind. Uh, yep. Sometimes uh, because, you know, you very quickly get to a point where you love it and then you spend what seems like a million years trying to get it just whatever it needs to be to, to, to be that point where everyone's like, that's it, you know? Um, yep. and it can be frustrating. It's, it's revisions and it's going back and it's thinking you did it and then listening to it the next morning and realizing you hate it. And, uh, you know, it's just that, that whole process. <laughs> but I will say that when you, when you feel like you got it, that's incredible, re- incredibly rewarding and makes it all worth it. Yeah, um, pretty magical. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let me ask real quick, just to go back to the the mics and the mic selection and whatnot. Yeah, do you spend a period saying, you know, like you get a new artist in the in the studio and you know you're talking through things? You're like, you know what? Let's go. Let me put these three mics up, these three vocal mics for you, and let's hear. Let's audition some mics on your voice. Do you spend some time doing that, or do you have one that you're like SM7B? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, if if that's uh, or are you listening while you're talking? Are you sort of yes. subconsciously listening to the timbre of their voice going, oh, I know this charter oak, you know, badass 152 is going to sound great on your voice, whatever their thing is. You know? Yeah, I'd say it's a combination of, of all those things. I mean, situations are always different. Uh, in an ideal world, I'd love to always be able to set up three or four mics and, and audition them and listen back and make the decision. Um, but that's not always ideal or not always possible. Sometimes... I have to choose a mic given the the circumstance and the situation. Like if I'm doing a live recording, for example, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I'm doing video performances where we're recording the performance live that I need to mix and post and it's being shot live at the same time. And in that situation, the shot has to look good. So the singer might be sitting two feet away from the ride symbol that the drummers crash and interface, you know, because that's just a good composition. And so in that situation, I'm not going to set up a really big, beautiful, large diaphragm condenser by her face. Cause you're never going to hear anything she's <laughs> doing. She or he, you know? Um, yeah. So in that case, you know, obviously it's a situational thing. Um, in some cases it's sort of run and gun and we're in the moment and the idea is happening and I realize we need to capture it now. Um, and if that's the case, I'll grab whatever mic because I have been listening a little bit, obviously. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Got it. And I'll grab something and go. But, uh, yeah. When, when we do have those moments where it's just a traditional, like, okay, someone's coming in, we're going to record vocals today, you know, and it's kind of planned out, uh, yeah. then yeah, absolutely. Or any other instrument for that matter. You know, it's, I think it's always fun when you get something in that you've never really tracked or recorded before or, or something. Sure. Like it's fun when I had a session a few weeks ago with a, a cello player, you know, um, and I've done some string sections stuff before and things like that, but this was a solo cello performance that was going to be in sort of a pop rock style song and it's kind of like, oh, okay, cool. How do we capture all the nuances and beauty of this instrument and have it cut through some electric guitars, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's always different. But that's what I think is fun about it. That's why I I, I love it. I could talk about this stuff all day, you know, just just geek <laughs> yeah. out about uh, about recording processes and, and, and mindset of it. Who are some of the engineer producers out there uh, that you look toward? Is there a sound that you're kind of chasing or that you favor that you're like, man, if I could get it like that guy or gal, that would be not really. No, I I could make that record. I don't, yeah. I don't know that it's a dis. if it's a disappointing answer, but I, I've first of all, never been good with names. I'm one of those people. I'm really bad about it. So I can't spout out a bunch of names, but I definitely, I listen to a lot of music. Um, I don't have any one particular, engineer per se that that or or producer that 
I think stands out to me as an influence, but I definitely have albums. I definitely have artists. Um, I have maybe like just little five second snippets of songs where something happens yep. in that song and I'm like, Ooh, that was tasty. And it sort of like right. locks away in there. Um, yeah. Like, uh, you know, Beck's sea change would be an album for me. That's like on a production level, desert Island album. Like it's just yeah. an incredible production. It's, it's so beautiful. That's one of those yeah. albums I can put on any time and just disappear, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. but you know, I, I, I thought, the the Casey Musgraves album uh, Golden mm-hmm. Hour that was like on a production level just phenomenal. Uh, it's just so many different production little candy bits in there that that are so yep. cool and so interesting and definitely deliberate. Where I'm like, well, why would you do that on a country album? But it's so good, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. So I'd say I more kind of fall in line with that. Um, and then as far as overall sounds, you know, I, I feel like that always changes. I listen to everything. You know, yeah. I listen to everything. Yeah. I, I grew up, uh, my, my dad was a, a saxophone player when he was younger. Um, and at that time he was in a small town in Sweden. My parents were both Swedish and, um, you know, he was playing in, uh, in a little like big band, like a dance band. So, you know, he was playing at like the school dances and the, and the parties and the festivals and things. So growing up, you know, he was very much into swing, big bands, jazz music, um, things like that. So I listened to a lot of that growing up and I, and I still love it. I got to play in a lot of big bands and play a lot of swing and jazz growing up. And, um, I, you know, still probably 60% of my, my record collection is, is, you know, just jazz and big band and swing. And, and I just love yeah. it. It's comfort food for me. You know, I can put it yeah. on and, yeah. and it's just, it's good. Um, but you know, in middle school, got into rock and roll. I started playing electric guitar just because that's what everyone was doing. And the saxophone wasn't as cool as the electric guitar. Uh, yep. Then later on in life, I realized the saxophone's way cooler than the electric guitar and lean more back <laughs> into that again. And, um, <laughs> you know, obviously hugely influenced by, you know, went through a, a period of like Black Sabbath and Nirvana and Metallica and then started yeah, getting had into- to get your angst on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then discovered, you know, like Smashing Pumpkins and Radiohead and- uh, and then Rage Against the Machine and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and all this stuff. And then I started getting into funk music. I discovered, you know, um, uh, um, like the album Fresh is, is just yep. phenomenal. Um, and, and just all this kind of stuff, the, the Ohio players, uh, you know, started getting into that stuff. And then, uh, I don't know, man, I'm just always on this journey. I feel like the one thing that nobody's gotten me to really, really dig into hard yet is, is heavy metal. But other than that, you, you and me both, man, people have tried, people have tried. You yeah, know? yeah. I, I have too. a few metalhead friends that will always be like, you got to listen to this one. Trust me, this one will get you hooked. And I listen to it. I'm like, I mean, it's good. It just, I don't know. Yeah. I can't, I can't, it doesn't grab me. You know, it's funny. But, I, I didn't get a motorhead album until about three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I and I finally got Ace of Spades. Yeah. You're listening to that record? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm driving up and back from Connecticut on the sawmill, that's that's the shit right that's, there. That's That'll the get theme. you back that's up here the- quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um <sighs> tell me where exactly the studio is. So I am uh on the outskirts of downtown Brooklyn, just bordering uh like the Dumbo area. So over by the Manhattan okay. Bridge. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, give me the layout. I can tell from some of the couch sessions that there looks like maybe they're playing behind you on a couch. Pretty much, yeah. Underneath yep. the logo there. All right. Yeah, so and we are do you have- filming also? Or yeah. you have someone else come in and help with the filming? Or you do everything? Uh, some, You're the guy. Sometimes I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to have somebody help me with the camera work. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times it's me. Yeah. And uh, that whole thing, I got into doing video- uh, in the first place, just kind of by mistake. Um, when I, when I first started doing full time with the studio thing, uh, I was working out in my apartment and, uh, it's just a one bedroom, New York apartment, you know, pretty tight. Um, and I had a bunch of work at that first, just because I had projects that had gotten backed up and that's why I ended up leaving my job, uh, with mm-hmm. guitar center. And so at first I was really busy. I was like, great. I got all this time to do all these projects I have on my plate that are backed up. And then I ran out of those projects and was like, I have nothing to do now. Um, and I was hanging out with a, a friend of mine here at the apartment and, and he's a phenomenal singer and, and songwriter and guitar player. And we were both just scrolling through our Instagram feeds and we were, 
you know, just, just sort of like digging on all these musicians that we know that are doing these amazing performances, sitting on their beds and their couches at home and all doing the same thing, putting their iPhone on the coffee table. And they're like, Hey everybody, here's this song that I wrote. And, um, and, but they're really good. And so many times I see them and I was talking to them and I was like, I wish I could have had the opportunity to capture that performance for them. Like that was, right. that was so awesome. Um, yeah. and he was like, Oh, I wish, I wish that too, man. And he's like, I do these and I, I wish that you would capture them. And, so we both kind of looked at each other and we realized like, we're sitting here, we got a Pro Tools rig, we got all this stuff. We? I was like, yeah. you know, like, let's, let's just try to do one real quick. So, so we, we did one, uh, he sat on my couch and we set up two iPhones, uh, and just hit record and I'd set up the mics and he did a few live songs and then we popped them into iMovie and cut them together and mixed them in Pro Tools and synced it up and put it out there. And then all of a sudden people started hitting me up and being like, Hey, can I do one of those? You know, and, That's and awesome, man. so it just turned into something that organic and, and it's fun, you know, sometimes I don't do one for months and sometimes all of a sudden five people hit me up all at once and they want to do them. And, uh, it's, yep. it's evolved slowly over time. It, it started to teach me about things like lighting and things, uh, like having a camera that can actually see, you know, the light well matters. Right. Um, right. So not you know. just an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, I think they've gotten better now, but uh, I yeah. still have the same one that I had back then. And, you know, if, if the light's not bright, then it's really grainy. And then if you make it bright, yeah. it doesn't look intimate at all, which is very kind of a turnoff and, and not very exciting yeah. to watch this solo acoustic performance. It's like pff, bright white, you know? Um, right, exactly. So just things like that. And now, you know, now we're shooting with, with mirrorless cameras and, um, you know, having a little bit of fun with that and we can actually get some lighting going on and, and, yeah. um, you know, it's sort of grown a little bit into sometimes even doing like full four or five piece band performances, um, you know, helped a lot of independent artists do their, their tiny desk audition things through these and, uh, you know, stuff like that. So that's super cool, man. Yeah. But back you to, have a, do you have a live room as well in there or is it just that space? So we have just that, that one main room. It's, it's not very big. Um, it's a 13 by 20 room. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, 250 square feet. Does that sound right? Something like that. Um, and then we have a sure. second, we have a second room as well, uh, on the same floor of the building there. So it's, it's very accessible and that's, it's a booth and it's mostly storage. Um, you know, it's a okay. smaller, smaller room. Um, but it's nice because, you know, again, I, I work with a lot of acoustic performance and a lot of, uh, capturing real instruments and things like that. So, you know, we've got a couple different drum kits. We've got a big collection of, of guitars and, and basses and, you know, amps and, uh, and then of course there's all just the, the random things that you have to have on hand, like adapters and tools yep. and zip ties and duct tape and like, oh, you know, it just, it, it piles up and it adds up. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so we've got the second room that, that sort of doubles as hanging on to all of those things for when we need them and also can be used as a booth if we need a, a separate ISO room. But yeah, mainly we just work out of the, the one room there. Um, it's, it's, uh, my desk on one end and a drum kit and a stack of amps and a couch and a fridge and a coffee machine, you know? It's all you need. Yeah. Endless hours to get it all done. I, I, I like the fact that you, you offer the couch sessions and, and the video and whatnot, you know, cause I think it's important to be able to be as versatile as possible. Yeah. And if someone just sees the couch sessions, let's say, and they're just coming to you to get filmed, then that is a new way in for them to be like, oh, this is a cool vibe in here. Like I'd come in and record in here. Right. And then. Yeah. Then yeah. And the thing is like everybody, everybody. And, and again, a lot of people I, I work with are independent artists that are at somewhere between, hey, I just started a band and we started playing some gigs and we're thinking about taking this seriously all the way to you know, a band that's got a couple albums out that's done a couple national tours and they're doing really well, but they don't want to be with like a, a major label and do that whole route. Um, so they're just looking for, so it, it could be anybody from, from A to Z within that range is most of the people that I work with in the music world, at least. Um, yeah. and I, I like that pocket. I like that, that group of people because there's, there's still a lot of exploration going on. There's still a lot of, of, room to pivot and, and discover, you know, um, and yeah. it's fun. I enjoy that. It's, it's a good time. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, exactly. There's a lot of innocence right there. <laughs> so the, the, the couch sessions ended up just sort of organically becoming uh, a really good option for, um, 
for that artist who is sort of in that that beginning stage of of like, hey, we've got this thing. We kind of want more people to find out about it. We don't really have any marketing material and we're not really quite ready to to commit to going into a big studio and doing a full album and dropping a bunch of money. Um, and it's like, cool, well, here's this thing. You come in here, it takes you like an hour or two and lay down a couple of things and then leave. And then the very next day I send you a video, it's cut, it's mixed, it's done. Uh, and it doesn't cost a lot of money because we do it quick and down and dirty, you know? Right, um, right. And it's designed and, and I've kept it to be that way. So it's, it's affordable, it creates content. And then what I've noticed happens is obviously, you know, six months down the road or a year down the road. And if they're still cruising and doing their thing and now they're kind of ready to start recording, well, they've, they've got a guy, you know, yeah, um, exactly. They, they have exactly. something that they know. It's an opportunity for me to meet people, uh, and, and gain and gain relationships through it. So it sort of doubles yeah. as, as, a a, a service that I offer and also really just networking, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a phenomenal chance and you're building trust with somebody. Yeah. And a lot of the people that hit me up for those are are people that see their friend did one. That's almost always the case. You know, somebody calls me and they're like, Hey, I I just saw this video that my friend so-and-so did of them playing a song. It was awesome. And I, and I saw that you were the one that did it and they told me to hit you up. Can I do one of those, you know, and then boom, there's a new, new relationship. So it's, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Um, I want to end on a, on a couple of bits of advice here, not not from me to you, but from you to the to the other folks out there that are starting. You're, let's say, let's say you're four or five years down the road in terms of having a business uh, and starting this whole thing a year, year and a half to having the actual brick and mortar. What are a few tips, strategies, words of wisdom that we can leave? Uh, anyone out there who's thinking about starting, even if it's a small home studio or looking to take their current studio up to the next level, what are some things that you've put into place for yourself? What are some things you would offer uh, to some other folks? Sure. Um, Well, as far as the recording process itself goes and capturing sound, um, a lot of people ask me about gear. A lot of people ask me about that kind of thing. And, and, and I have a decent collection built up from just having done this for a long time. And, and I had some great opportunities with my previous employment as well to be able to acquire some nice pieces. But I always teach people, you know, I have interns that work with me and I, and I always try to coach them as far as recording goes to, to train your ear first. You know, mm-hmm. um, you, you can't you can't get a really great snare drum recording if you don't know what a good snare drum sounds like. You can't mm-hmm. get a really great acoustic guitar recording if you don't know what a good acoustic guitar sounds like. You should be able to sit there in the room and listen to it critically and get it to sound good before you ever grab a microphone. So, um, you know, it's sort of that that shit in, shit out was how it was explained to me a long time ago, yeah. and I've, I've never really dropped that mentality. So training your ear and thinking critically with your ear, uh, that's more of a specific audio thing, I guess, if you're looking to take your studio to the next level because... Um, if you think of it that way, it makes you feel good and realizing that gear is not so important, you know, mm-hmm. it's, yep. it's, it's your ear. Um, right. Uh, as far as just more on the business side, and I think this can relate to, to anybody in any business, um, you know, building relationships with people um, is, is incredibly important, you know, making sure that, that you take the time to, to care about the people you work with and build a relationship with them and, and, you know, uh, treat rock stars like normal people and treat normal people like rock stars, you know? Um, yeah. I think that's huge. Just, just being able to get along with people because that fosters a community and it fosters a lot of opportunity and through opportunity, I think, you know, comes a lot of, uh, good business success. Um, cool, man. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think just, just if you enjoy working with people and if you like being around people, then build your business around something that allows you to be with the people you like hanging out with and, yep. and be able to sort of say piss off to the people you don't want to be around. Um, I yeah. think that was my main goal in, in starting my own business was just the opportunity to be able to say like, this is what I want to do. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, this is the life I want to live. And so I'm going to, do this business that allows me to live this life that I want to live. Um, you know, I, I, I don't do a lot of late evening sessions. I don't do weekend sessions. Uh, sometimes I make exceptions, obviously, you know, if, if I've got 
someone that I'm helping out and, and they need to do something and that's the only time available. Maybe it's a collaboration between a few people and getting schedules to combine is always tricky. Uh, but otherwise, mm-hmm. I, I don't do that. And people are always surprised with that. You know, there's... They say like, wait, you have a music recording studio and you don't do late nights and you don't work weekends. And I'm like, no, <laughs> how is that possible? And I'm like, well, I, it's pretty simple. Actually, I like to take my dog for a walk in the park and I like to hang out with my wife. And those things are important to me as well. And, yeah. uh, and most of the musicians that I talk to, when I explain that to them, they, they're actually, they love it. They think it's great. You know, so it's a bit um, more of that daytime, <clears throat> daytime nine to five Nashville thing. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, like yeah. I said, I mean, uh, occasionally here and then I'm happy to make an exception, but, but people know that, that that's just, those are the hours that I work. Um, and it's, it's good, you know? So anybody who's looking to start a business, I think it's important to obviously look at the, um, the common sense things like, can I do this for a living? Can I make money doing this? How am I going to do that and everything? But I think it's really important that you also look at, you know, what do I want my life to look like and, and what's important to me outside of work and outside of business uh, mm-hmm. and make sure that if you're going to put in the time and the effort and, and the risk that it takes to, to start your own thing, it better be worth it if you pull it off, you know, otherwise you'll end yeah. up in a, in a position down the road where you pulled it off and you're like, Oh, and now I just hate what I do again. Uh, and that, yeah. that's, <laughs> so. well, and it leads to burnout too. I mean, you know, I think obviously there are a lot of studio owners out there that they're working 24 seven, seven days a week, right? It doesn't matter. They're, or their session starts late sure. and they go in the middle of the night. And, and I can see that, said for that out. you know, yeah. It, there, and there's, I, I think again, if it's, if it works for them or works for you, cool. Like you got to find what works for you and what's important to you. Your, your schedule, your way of doing it. I can see, you know, you get two days off, you get Saturday, Sunday off. By the time you come back in on Monday, your ears are rested, you're fresh, <clears throat> Yeah. Right. You're, you're sort of ready to rock again. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, there's something to like, you know, you do got to put in your time and you got to put in your hours and, and you got to, at some point in your life, you do got to cut your teeth and, and mm-hmm. get the experience to be able to get to a point where you feel good about what you do. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's true. I mean, I, you know, when I was, when I was in college, I mean, I was doing studio stuff all day in class and, and then I was in a couple of ensembles. So I was in rehearsals and I had to practice for those things. And then I had a home studio in my house and, and so I'd come home yeah. from class and then immediately I'd have bands over at my house and we'd be recording stuff and then I'd stay up all night. And I, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I went through that period of time for sure. I mean, long before I started my own studio business, but, um, I think there's, you know, definitely something to be said about, um, putting in the time to, to learn and hone your craft. Um, but at the point where I'm at now, I, f- I feel like I'm still learning. I mean, I hope I never stop, you know, I, I feel like every day is still exploration, but, um, yeah. But I, I put in that time and I put in those hours and I feel confident about being able to achieve things and, and get good sounds and, and make the people I work with happy and make them want to come back again. So, um, you know, it, I guess it's just a maturity thing or a stage of life thing. But um, for me, when I when I finally took the move to, to start my own business, that was that was important work life balance and, and making sure that I kept those things in check. Nice, man. Eric, this has been awesome. I'm glad we got to do this. Um, and uh, we got to give a shout out to your sister, Emily. Yeah, I was going to say, we, we didn't even talk happen. about that. You're, you're in Washington, right? I am. I'm nice. down the road from her. Nice. I love it yeah. up there. My, my wife I and I you go were up, there up here all recently. the time. Yeah. You yeah, guys yeah. were up here like a couple weeks ago or something, right? Yep. Yeah, not too like long that. ago at yeah. all. Yeah, we... Good, man. It's a nice, it's a nice thing because we get burnt out with the city and we can go up to the middle of nowhere and they get burnt out with the middle of nowhere and they can come down to the city and, <laughs> exactly. um, you know, they've got two Huskies and we've got a black lab. And so it's, yep. it's, it works out really well, but yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah we're, we're probably 10 minutes from each other. Nice. And then I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in between her house and the depot where the bookstore is. Yeah. Yeah. So I've driven, I'm, I'm I've driven right by you many road. times. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. For sure. Uh, well, good. Well, next time you come up, you should come on over and, uh, and we'll hang. Let's do that. All right, dude. Eric, good luck down there. Thank you. You as well. All right. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Yep. Got my hand sanitizer right here. There you go. <laughs> Ready to go, man. Ready to go. I'm going to burn this um, pop filter right after we're done talking. Yeah, burn that shit. Spray this one down. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know, you know, it's funny, a couple of weeks ago, and then I'll let you go, I uh, I was doing a shoot in Philly, right, as this was all starting to break down. Yeah. And um, 
every person I put the lavalier on afterward, I was like, had the wet wipes out. I was wiping that shit down, getting everything cleaned up and then moving on to the next interview. And I think if nothing else, this will hopefully give us all good, um, training and preparation and just some basic things to think about. Well, yeah, on I mean, a even, daily level, right? even like what you were just saying with gear, like I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a really clean person. I don't like mess. I don't like clutter. I don't like those things. I, you know, I vacuum yeah. all the time because my dog is always at the studio with me and I don't ever want it to be hairy, right. you know, and things like yeah. that. But like all of a sudden I'm thinking about the fact that I was like, man, I, I don't ever regularly like disinfect my microphones and things, you know, I just, yeah, I don't, yeah. some of, so many of those things that I never really thought about it. Now I'm like, oh, I need to go through all of this now. Like, <laughs> exactly. You know, like wiping down yeah. cables and, you know, it's like oh, yeah. cleaning off my, my laptop computer keyboard and realizing how crusty it is. And yeah, and that's your first day back when you get back to the studio. It's yep. just a bucket of disinfectant and yep. some rags and get to work, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, dude. You be well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. It's been fun. Eric, man, thank you so much for doing the show. I really appreciate it. Hope you get through this time like the rest of us, dude. Guys, stay tuned. Next week, we got episode 165, man. Keith Nobler, head audio engineer for Bill Graham Civic Auditorium in San Francisco, is my guest. You can follow us during the week at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and Spotify. All is Roadie Free Radio. Check out the website, roadiefreeradio.com. Send me a note because you know I want to hear from you. That's info at roadiefreeradio.com. And my Friends, in the meantime, wash your hands and y'all be safe out there. No roadies, no rock and roll.